Hi everyone, my name is Osama Kashla. I'm one of the neurosurgeons at the University of Michigan. I wanted to thank CNS for giving me the opportunity to give this talk today uh, to introduce you to spine endoscopy. Before going into the talk, I wanted to uh, let you know about my conflict of interest. I am a teaching faculty for Joymax. And in terms of what I'm gonna to talk to, to you about today, at first I wanted to talk about the types of spine endoscopy and then talk about why endoscopy is important for a spine surgeon, talk about the components of an endoscope, uh, and then finally talk about endoscopic approaches with some example cases. So specifically, the type of endoscopy I'm talking about today is uniportal whole endoscopic approaches. So it's good to keep in mind uh, when comparing this and when talking about this, uh, uh, and comparing it to other uh, types of endoscopy as noted here, which are biportal and endoscopic assisted. So why does endoscopy work for me? You know, a lot of people say, you know, this is too difficult. Such, it has such a steep learning curve. We're already treating conditions with pretty good outcomes without endoscopy. Why do I introduce this variable into my practice? Um, why am I going to decrease my productivity initially? You know, because these procedures take a long time to, to learn. Um, and, and, you know, you are going to have a drop in your productivity initially in terms of time of surgery. Uh, and then there's the equipment uh, expense. You know, how am I going to sell this technology to the hospital systems? And, you know, to answer these questions, I have uh, what's on this next slide here, which are what are the benefits? Why did I decide to learn this? Why do I decide to offer this to my patients? Um, and I think the number one reason is, you know, for thoracic disc herniations, I think at some point this is going to be probably standard of care for a lot of thoracic discs. Managing patients with large BMI, you know, you're really bringing your eye close to the lesion rather than using a microscope where you're super far away or doing things open where, you know, you're looking outside the patient into where the lesion is. Endoscopy really allows you to bring your visualization very close to the lesion itself. Um, you know, the utilization of the transforaminal route, you know, going through the foramen through Campus Triangle, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is something that you could do with an endoscope that's really a very, very minimal in terms of the disruption of the tissues that you can't do as well with the microscope through a tube or through an open approach. Uh, and that takes us to the next point. There's really less soft tissue manipulation and dissection and bony removal to get to the lesion. So you're minimizing the collateral damage to get to the lesion that you need uh, to get to. Um, the, the great thing about this, uh, about endoscopy is, you know, the duronomy risk is lower uh, than what you'd expect. And the reason why is once you get to the dura, into the epidural space, the irrigation pushes everything away. So it's like having a very smooth, wide retractor uh, that pushes all the neural elements away from you. And because it's under constant irrigation, the infection risk is almost zero. Um, and you see the last thing that I wrote here is a smaller incision size. You're able to do surgeries uh, with a fraction of the incision size compared to minimally invasive uh, microscopic and open procedures. So what is, are the components of an endoscope? So in terms of the endoscope itself, it has a working channel, where, which is where you can put in multiple types of instruments. You have kerosens, you have rongeurs, you have very similar instruments to what you use in minimally invasive microscopic and in open procedures, but they're just smaller so that they could fit in through the working channel. You have irrigation ports and you have uh, a light source. Um, and it's important to note that different companies have different sizes of working channels that allow you to do different things, but this is out of the scope of this presentation where I'm just introducing you to the um, basics of endoscopy. There are two types of endoscopic approaches. You have the interlaminar approach, which is noted here on the slide. That's very similar to the approaches that we take through an open procedure or a minimally invasive microscopic procedure. But what the endoscope really adds is a transforaminal approach. As you can see here on the slide, the transforaminal approach uh, gets to the lesion, in this example, a lateral recess disc herniation through a completely different approach, which minimizes the need for a laminectomy. You can really go straight to doing a discectomy without removing any of the patient's uh, bone uh, and disrupting the ligaments in that area. So looking specifically at the interlaminar approach, what does this approach uh, treat? So it treats uh, uh, multiple conditions, including disc herniations, mostly at L5-S1 uh, and at other levels too, 
uh, treats lateral recess stenosis, it treats central stenosis, whether it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, uh, and it can treat also cervical foraminal stenosis as well. So it's really an approach that, that can treat numerous lesions. Um, I wanted to showcase an example of this interlaminar approach with uh, taking care of a patient with central and lateral recess lumbar stenosis. So this patient presented to me with neurogenic claudication in bilateral lower extremities on examination intact. And this is his imaging showing uh, multi-level stenosis worst at L4-5 where he has pretty severe stenosis there as you can see on the axial scan. At L3-4, which is not uh, shown here on the axial, he has probably moderate stenosis, I would say. So for this patient, he had exhausted conservative measures. He was a candidate for surgery and uh, he was a candidate for a two-level laminectomy. Um, and this is where endoscopy is, is really nice. So uh, I spent some time in Korea with uh, uh, Hyun Sun Kim um, in Seoul. And when I was there, I was uh, amazed at the outcomes uh, after doing a stenosis operation with an endoscope. And these are two examples here where you had schizos grade C and D, these are measures of how uh, bad stenosis is preoperatively. And you can look at a post-op scan showing a complete resolution in a schizos A, so uh, a, a, a very minimal stenosis at those levels. So when we looked at this all together, we showed that in the patients in this study, all the patients improved their schizos grade postoperatively. And when you did a volumetric analysis of the bone pre-op and post-op, it showed that really the bony removal that was done is minimal. You see on the ipsilateral side of our approach, we have a very small, tiny bony window. And with that bony window, we're able to get the uh, results in terms of the uh, ligamentous removal and the improvement in the grade of stenosis. And when we looked at this, we saw that we're really taking a fraction of the lamina off and a fraction of the facets off uh, when compared to open procedures. So in this example, that's what I offered this patient. And this is an introp uh, uh, x-ray showing on the left side, on, on your left side, showing uh, the ipsilateral extent of the decompression. You see the endoscope is really flush with the pedicles ipsilaterally. And then on the right, it shows how far uh, across you can reach. So that's a kerosene there that's in line with the pedicles on that side. So you can get a really nice decompression with a very, very tiny bony window, minimal destruction of tissue and a one centimeter incision. And this is a post-op scan showing complete resolution of the patient's stenosis on the left. That's a pre-op scan. On the right, it's a post-op scan showing complete resolution of the stenosis at both those levels. So now going on to the transforaminal route. Transforaminal route is, is, is a very important part of endoscopy. It's in a way what it kind of separates it from other uh, approaches. And this can treat lumbar and thoracic disc herniations and isolated foraminal stenosis uh, in the uh, 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 lumbar or thoracic spine. And you can see that uh, transforaminal, you can really get a lesion that's superior, inferior to the disc space, depending on your angle of approach, as you can see here on this figure. Uh, and the, the area that you're accessing with the transforaminal route is Camden's triangle which is really this area here that is uh, bordered by the superior articulating process of the inferior level, the uh, superior aspect of the vertebral body of the inferior level, and the spinal nerve. Uh, that is the that's the triangle, uh, more recently called prism, that you're accessing with the transforaminal route. So I wanted to show this uh, uh, um, transforaminal uh, uh, route or this uh, exposure by demonstrating treatment of a thoracic disc. So this is a patient that presented numerous comorbidities with a clear thoracic myelopathy, symptoms and signs. Uh, in terms of his imaging, had a large thoracic disc, uh, as you can see here, showing compression of the uh, thoracic cord. Um, he was worked up by neurology and uh, was shown to have no other causes to his thoracic myelopathy. Uh, so then at that point, we decided to treat this uh, thoracic disc. In terms of the options, historically, you know, you could treat this with a thoracotomy to do a, a discectomy. This was a T89 level, possible fusion. You could do a, a posterolateral lateral approach, whether it's a transpedicular or a costa transversectomy. Uh, but those are very morbid procedures. It requires, in some cases, a lot of instrumentation, large incision. Um, so with endoscopy, you really could 
do an endoscopic left transpyramidal discectomy. And this is a figure here showing the intraoperative x-rays showing accessing the T89 level. And you can see here there's cement there that I marked to make sure that we got the correct level. And this is our endoscope working channel uh, docked at the T89 level. And this is a figure here showing uh, the multiple areas that you're able to access. So you can see you're really able to access multiple areas, whether it's superior, inferior, ipsilateral, contralateral, and you're able to get past the midline even, as you can see here in the second figure. Um, and this went really well. This is a post-op CT scan showing the very minimal destruction of the, of the bone here, way less than you would do with any other approach. And this is a post-operative MRI showing complete resolution of the disc herniation um, uh, at, at the T89 level. So this patient did really well, um, had an incision that was six to seven millimeters in length. And when he came back for his post-op visit, I couldn't even find it because he was a hairier guy. A second example is the large central disc in a patient with a high BMI, again, signifying how great these procedures are in patients with large BMI. So this is an obese female that presented with a clear lumbar radiculopathy, exhausted conservative measures in the setting of this large central disc herniation at L4-5. Um, for this patient, you have multiple open and microscopic uh, minimally invasive approaches that you can offer, but with endoscopy, you could do a transferaminal endoscopic approach for a discectomy. And this is what we ended up doing. So as you can see here, this is an intraop radiograph or fluoroscopy shot showing how lateral you can get. I mean, I'm all the way across here to the pedicle uh, below. Um, and uh, in the second figure, you can see uh, at the level of the superior aspect of the disc space, all the way over to the level of the uh, uh, medial aspect of the pedicles on that side. This is a post-op scan showing much greater improvement in her uh, disc herniation uh, and her symptoms resolved completely. So in summary, spine endoscopy it can be super useful to a spine surgeon. It's a skill that is worthwhile to learn. Uh, in my opinion, I think it might become standard of care for thoracic disc herniations. Uh, and we talked about the two approaches, the transferaminal route versus the interlaminar route and the different lesions that you could treat with either uh, approach. Um, again, I appreciate the CNS for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, and please reach out to me by email um, at the University of Michigan uh, if there are any questions or anything else that could be uh, of any assistance. All right, thank you.